Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doom Productions podcast. Today, we have a special guest joining us today. Uh, I'm sitting down with Alex Clegg of Late Night 99 Films, fellow YouTube channel. And when this is coming out, um, it'll be January of 2023, but we're recording this in December 2022. And this has really been kind of the year for your channel and for all the projects you've got going on. Um, and to say that you guys have um, have been like such a, a, a prominent voice in kind of the independent filmmaking sphere on YouTube is kind of an understatement. I really feel like last year in particular, you guys took, uh, took the internet sphere by storm in a way. So uh, welcome to the channel, and why don't you introduce yourself to anyone who is unaware of your channel? Yeah, sweet. Um, so my name's Alex, as you said. Um, for the last, I'd say, probably since I was six years old, I've been making movies. Um, it's just, it's developed over time into a, a bigger and bigger passion for me and something that's become more and more important to me um, as I've grown as a filmmaker um and and yeah basically around uh the end of 2020 uh i decided that i wanted to take it a little bit more seriously i'd been making a lot of sort of sketch films and um i had this really great i can well have so much time to talk but there oh there was this project called a few grumpy bees which was uh which was a really huge project that we worked on throughout all of uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, I say me, me and my group of friends uh, and sort of following that big, it was a feature film, but it was this silly, insane project. Uh, and then following that, I sort of took, um, uh, I sort of looked at everything I had, all my resources and I was like, okay, well, what what do I want to do next? Like, what, what do I actually want to do with this filmmaking thing? And um, consequently, I started to look at making some more, what I, what I referred to at the time as like serious movies. Um, but I look back on the movies I was making then and go and cringe and go, oh, that wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure I'll look back at the movies I'm making now in another two years time and go, oh, right. what I was serious then and that wasn't very good either. But uh, the the idea behind late night ninety nine was, was I sort of wanted to legitimise the art and, and the work that I was doing uh, under sort of like an umbrella, um, yeah, sort of an umbrella like uh, channel or location. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. And are you primarily working with the same people from film to film? Yeah. So for. So a lot of the the films that I make, I I make along with my my wife. She's mm -hmm. huge help and, and very patient. Um, Great my, actress too. Yeah, yeah, she's amazing. <laughs> and uh, my my friends Joel and Adrian, um, mm -hmm. they they're uh, friends that I've had essentially since preschool, um, and then all through primary school and high school, we made movies together. So that, of course, translated over here. Um, Adrian's a great actor and director. He was in Over the Next Horizon as the, mm -hmm. um, you know, third act protagonist. He was in uh, Vigil and a few of the other films. Um, and Joel, Joel's not actually been in any of the movies, but he's sort of the, the writer of our group. He, um, we all suck at writing. Like, I don't, I'm a terrible writer. Mm -hmm. So we rely on him to, to proofread our scripts and, and then to, to uh, help us um, right. in, that, in that sphere. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, I've, I've sort of become really great friends with this guy named Anton. Mm -hmm. So Anton directed Don't Scream and Bound. And then he's had his own filmography outside of Late Night 99. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. And, um, and so Anton's from Sweden. He traveled over to Australia to live on the Gold Coast uh, for filmmaking opportunities. And um, yeah, so he's, he's um, really been growing in his uh, career and, and, and 
excitingly, as of 2023, we'll, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a bit more of a backseat on the late night 99 front and take more of a producing, um, distributing role and um, and a few of the other filmmakers like Anton, there's this guy named Anantha, um, Joel and Adrian are gonna take more of a uh, front seat and we're gonna, uh, late night 99 is gonna shift into more of a syndicate of filmmakers mm -hmm. rather than a, um, the Alex show because um, that's not super sustainable um, mm -hmm. when you wanna have a family and, and you wanna, um, you know, when, it, when it's not your full-time career. Um, right, right. Yeah. That sounds very familiar to how uh, Ethan and I kind of started out and how I know some other channels like RC Films or 922, or well, Dan Lotz's channel. I don't know what it's called now. Mm -hmm. He's kind of changing the names at the moment. But um, yeah, I'm lamenting the loss of 922 Films because I, I just love that. Um, yeah, I love that name so much, but... Um, great and it was a great logo too just very it had just a nice vibe whenever that logo would pop on screen yeah the little um, circle would go, doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah yeah but it's it's uh it's interesting to see that there's you know back taking a step back just a little bit mm -hmm. um it when ethan and i started out finding out that there were other people um who were making feature films and putting them on youtube that was kind of a game changer for us. And we were like, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, there's more people like us. And getting to talk and know some of these folks, um, it's just funny, all those little um, similarities. And one of those things that I've noticed is uh, everyone who starts these channels, or for the most part, they kind of, uh, they do wanna be directors and they wanna make films, but at the same time, they're really interested in also shepherding work of other filmmakers and not having their voice be the, sole voice on their channel under their banner of whatever that might be. I was talking with uh, RC Films the other day and they were telling me that they're trying to court this newer filmmaker, this guy who's never made a movie before, but he really wants to and they're trying to loop him into uh, directing a movie. That's their thing, so I'm not gonna spoil any details or anything, but that's, yeah, that's, cool. really, that's really cool that you, uh, you kind of have a nice team around you. Is there mm. a is there an aspect of filmmaking that you're drawn to the most out of the whole process? Cause you do it all, you act, you write, edit. I mean, you, you've done it all. So what's your favorite part of it? Uh, well, I'm, I, I, a lot of the aspects of filmmaking that I would be doing, I, I do out of pure necessity, not because it's right. <laughs> or something I think I'm good at. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I think I'm a terrible actor. I think uh, I, it's probably cinematography is mm -hmm. where I land as, as my, my sort of comfort zone. I think cinematography is where I feel a lot more comfortable and, um, and maybe directing. I've mm -hmm. really enjoyed, I've learned a lot from my buddy Anton about directing recently because we sort of were, were co-directing because he, uh, due to some people pulling out, he was forced to act and don't scream. Mm -hmm. He was the uh, killer at the end. Okay, and, okay. Um, Due to that, I was, I was forced to step into some directing shoes and, and there's a, uh, a moment that I remember really clearly when uh, we started filming and I started to direct and Anton sort of sat back and watched me direct and I was saying to the person that I was directing, oh, do it like this. And then I did what I wanted them to do and do it like this. And I was just, they, I was getting them to copy me and the way I was speaking and mm -hmm. just not directing very well. And Anton pulled me aside and he basically said, stop, stop trying to direct, watch me for a little bit and then copy what I do. And, and the way that he supported the actors was so much better and um, was really exciting for me. And, and I took that into the next couple of projects I did mm -hmm. and kept thinking about that conversation kept thinking about what was being modeled to me and, um, uh, and it's just sort of it's the kind of thing that you guys have talked about as well um on doom productions in your bts diy space of things and it's, it's just things like coaxing actors into the um into the headspace of their characters and 
and supporting them to to understand how how their character feels and how they um what their character might be going through and uh and and, and taking a step back from like you need to fit into this box of what i imagine the performance to be right. and more empowering them and you know, i suck at conversations so i just go in circles and then <laughs> tangent and stuff but so directing and cinematography is where 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 my ballpark is but mm -hmm. um yeah and i suck at writing and acting so i need um it's yeah it's a it's a team effort filmmaking but i i mean i wouldn't discredit your acting entirely like i think that all the performance you've given this year um those have been totally awesome in the projects that they were used in um because you're also working within a genre space um mm. of filmmaking like horror or um kind of post-apocalyptic so you know and I, I think what's nice about because i i'm in the same boat where a lot of times when i've been on camera it's been because i don't have anybody else and so mm. i don't necessarily write outside of my wheelhouse outside of what i know i can do so i just i limit it to what i know i can do and mm. put it in a genre one because mm. i just love genre filmmaking but also because um when it doesn't have to be totally realistic or or real or realism um it makes it frees you up a little bit to make more interesting choices i think yeah and and, and you'll find as well that the first couple of short films on late night 99 mm -hmm. were didn't star me i wasn't acting until a bit later in the channel and my my confidence to act actually came from watching people like yourselves and and dan lots and joel haver and 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 being introduced to the idea of re resource filmmaking or mm -hmm. um sort of working within your means and 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 that's kind of where over the next horizon started in a sense so i was like oh i really want to make a feature film look at all these dudes on youtube making feature films they can do it for free wow like i should do that because i, I want to make movies like mm -hmm. that's what i want to do and then i thought man like i can't get someone to commit to like 20 shooting days or 12 shooting days i later mm -hmm. could get someone to commit the three hours around the oscars time but um i'm thinking i can't like it's not fair for me to ask someone to do this for so long and not get paid so it kind of has to be me um and and that's the resource i have the most access to is time like i can i can go oh, I'll, I'll race out before the sun rises and get them you know just before i go to the office and get some really nice shots and then and then go to work uh right. and so if I was like, when I decided that I would act in it, I thought, oh, well, yeah, I've, I've crafted a story and developed the story that was inside my wheelhouse. And, mm -hmm. and a large part of that was minimizing dialogue and over the next horizon, it was right. a very silent movie through a lot of dialogue. And um, that was reflecting the confidence that I had at the time to deliver dialogue. Um, and um, so, yeah, that, yeah, it's it's very much about uh, framing what you have in the best possible on the light. It's going to look the best. Um, right. Yeah. Right. This is a super specific question, but you talk about getting people on board for helping your project and knowing you can't have people commit to, say, 20 shooting days or mm -hmm. a, couple, a lot of time. How did you get all the people? Because I just watched Over the Next Horizon a few days ago this week. It's been on my watch list forever. And I was like, okay, I'm going to talk with him. So I got to, I got to watch. Cause that's the one I haven't seen. Um, and I loved it. And again, super specific question. You had all those extras for a couple of scenes in the little camp in the yeah. film. Who were all those people? Were they friends, family? Did you put out a casting notice? Cause whenever I see a big crowd of people in a no budget film, I think, oh my goodness, where did they get all these people? Actually, uh, found them on the streets. We just started filming. Um, <laughs> they actually lived in there. That was a homeless um, camp. No. Um, what we did was, that was actually the last thing we filmed, mm -hmm. the whole film. We had, had already filmed the last act with my buddy, Adrian. We'd mm -hmm. already filmed the, the, the central this sort of story where I'm sort of stumbling around the place looking for charges. And then... The, the first act, we we didn't know what it would look like. And, and I say me, we, I mean, Joel, Adrian and I, um, mm -hmm. we're, we were in a bit of a writer's room trying to figure out what 
of the next horizon was going to be. So I just started this project. I, there's um, a sequence where I kind of walk into this abandoned building and there's these big wide um, sunset shots. And that was the first thing I filmed for Over the Next Horizon was this sort of um, just mood scene. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then it, I just improv the next scene, improv the previous scene and just kind of built it, like took random blocks and then built, um, built it from there. Mm -hmm. the, the last building block that had to go into place, or well, the second last really, because the flashbacks were the last building block. The, the second last building block was going to be that first act. And I, I, I knew that I wanted to show, I wanted, um, because the last part of the film was so lonely and so slow and quiet, I wanted to have a really busy full first act. Right. Uh, and... <laughs> uh, no worries. <laughs> So the first, the first act, I, I knew I wouldn't have lots of people, but I knew I couldn't get them for very long. So I, that was over one shooting day. I just got, uh, I put out a big casting call uh, and we ended up having, it went not viral, but it, it, it was shared a lot in the Australia, like in the Brisbane, um, Southeast Queensland filmmaking community. And we ended up having like 300 expressions of interest or 300 applications for the like six roles that we auditioned for nice uh, and which was insane but i knew that i couldn't uh i knew that i couldn't pay them and i wasn't super worried about performances at that time i was like oh sweet whoever wants to be i can work with anyone i can work with my wife who's not who, you know she's not an actor i can work with my, my you know six month old son at the time i can work with anyone like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter so i i filtered them not by by diversity i was like what is the most diverse group of people that i can find um, and, um, I didn't end up getting the most diverse group of people, but I asked the most diverse group of people to, to come be a part of it. So mm -hmm. by diversity, I went by, um, location, like how close are you to me? Cause I don't want to, we had people from a state away wanting to drive over and, and film with us. And I'm going, trust me, you don't want to, <laughs> Yeah. this isn't going to, uh, this isn't going to change your career. Don't. <laughs> Don't drive yeah. up from another state. Uh, and so, yeah, I went by, um, I went by location and, um, and I obviously made sure that everyone knew that I could not pay them. I was only providing um, catering and, and yeah, so that, that's where that group of people came from was, was online, just a Facebook group casting call. And that's, yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Um, Backing up even more, because that was a super selfish, specific question that I just had on my mind watching your movie. Um, why, why YouTube? Why, what specifically drew you to releasing these, your, all your work on YouTube? And why not go something more traditional, like the film festival route, or you know, putting your, your work on Amazon behind a paywall or something like that? Why, why on YouTube for free? I think, yeah, I think for me, the reason that I want to put all of our films on YouTube and why, why that's the home for them at the moment is that it comes down to why, why do I want to make movies? Why, why do I actually want to do this? What's the point? And for me, the point isn't to get remuneration or, or have money from it because realistically that's not going to happen anyway. Because I can go and release it. For, like, like, how do you get money from films, right? People have to watch mm -hmm. them, one. Which means people have to hear about them, two. Which means... So, so that's how you're going to... So to get people to hear about your movie or to, to have your movie become known, uh, you, you, the, the, the way that you can do that is um, what you can submit at film festivals. Uh, you can... Um, network around you can try and get a distribution deal you can um put it on film hub maybe might go on tubi Woo mm -hmm. and then <laughs> you know how many people are going to watch it then i don't know but for me it's not about making money from movies it's about entertaining people that's that's kind of the whole like the, the best part of making a movie is at the very end when you sit down with your family or you sit down with your friend and go look at this look, watch this right and you get them to watch the movie that you made and then you're not watching the movie you're watching them 
and watching their reaction to to your mm-hmm. movie um that's a that's the best part of it is is you know reading the comments you know um and 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 realizing that hey people liked this or hey people are actually enjoying what you're doing so for me youtube was a place where i could go and put my film and it had the greatest potential possible to reach the largest largest audience possible mm-hmm. and entertain the most amount of people that i possibly can so that that for me is where it's coming from and and then and then behind that is kind of this altruistic um you know, intention for like, hey, you know, independent film, hey, democratization of film. And it's kind of that as well, which right. is which is really exciting. And I really enjoy seeing seeing new independent films and and sharing them. And it's that's exciting for me. But the the selfish part of it and the and why for late night 99, why for me and my group of friends we're doing it here is hey, we just want people to watch our movies. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of the point. Right. And um, you know. Yeah, I can uh, I can definitely relate to all of that. That was very similar process between behind uh, Ethan and I, and when we started out, just releasing mm-hmm. our stuff online for free, because like you said, it was um it was just really discouraging of like the whole film festival process in particular. And that was kind of our goal for a long time, was mm-hmm. doing it through the film festivals, and we were just so discouraged by the whole thing. Not in the sense of we got like tons of rejection, because we had films play in festivals but even when a movie played it was never satisfying like we thought it would be so youtube just made like the most sense for for all the reasons you you listed and what's really cool in particular i have your channel pulled up here i mean you're you guys have a ton of views on your on your shorts and your videos um way more than i think people would have seen like I don't think if had you submitted to a festival or put your stuff on Tubi or wherever I don't think Mm -hmm. as many people would have seen all your stuff I mean just your uh, the don't scream has like five five point four k um over the next horizon what's that at like four k three point nine k um you guys have tons of views on your stuff um and I guess while we're on the, the subject it looks like do you, off the top of your head, do you know how many movies you've made this year? Oh, so we've made, if you're categorized, if you're classing um, feature films the same way that Dan Lotz and Joel Haver do, then I've got mm-hmm. two feature films okay. um, from this year. And then we made a whole bunch of really, or I made a whole bunch of filler short films, just little horror mood pieces. A ton, um, of, a ton of short films, yeah. So, but but then in terms of major short films, I think there's about eight or nine more okay. major, like like eight to sixteen minute short films that are that are a little bit more substantial. Um, right. Or, but yeah, and and in terms of the views and stuff, I I I see dis- distribution and and the marketing distribution of our films as just as important as any other part of the filmmaking process. So it, it's just as important to me that the film is properly cared for and looked after after it's you know it, it's almost like the the whole filmmaking process is the um is you know procreation you know the, right. the, uh, the growth of the baby and in, inside the womb and then the birth um is the probably the editing process i'd say is the um the final painful um conclusion to a baby being born but um once the baby's out there in the world you kind of have to you have this baby now and it's you know can go on a dumpster you can you know raise it to become elon musk or you know <laughs> mother Teresa or whatever but right the that, that that's what i kind of see the distribution process and the marketing process is is you've got this thing now what are you going to do with it is it going to sit on youtube and get you know 30 views is it going to go on a festival and then no one sees it for two years you're going to send it to boarding school like what are you going to do with this baby? Right. And what what tips do you have for other filmmakers for getting your work seen by people on YouTube? It's it's been it's really really tough. I I don't know how I I would probably put per per film in in the week after it's the film's released. I'd probably put about an hour per day for the following couple of weeks. Mm-hmm per film that is released and then i would say 
maybe in total, like maybe 20 or 30 hours per film, you know, so I'll, I definitely put way more into distributing than I do the, any sort of pre-production process, um, mm-hmm. but that's more a fault on my, uh, my end. It's, it's just, it's just time and effort and sincerity. I find are the keys to getting people to watch your movie. Cause mm-hmm. if you, it's like uh, sales, if you're in a kiosk in the middle of um, a shopping center and and you're trying to sell these raffle tickets or you're trying to sell your, um, you know, your soap or whatever. You, you're not going to get people by just saying, Hey, buy the soap. Hey, buy the soap. You're going to get people by, you're going to introduce yourself to them. You got to be a salesman. You got to be charismatic. And that's, a, I guess the approach that I take is I sort of treat myself a little bit like a salesman and take my films a little bit like the product. And then, mm-hmm. Um, think of ways, and, it, and it's a little bit path. Like it's a little bit pragmatic, but I go, okay, well, you know, end goal is people watch movie. So how I'm going to get there is um, they have to see the link to the movie, or they have to have an opportunity to watch the movie. And then how do I give them that opportunity to watch the movie? Well you can kind of reverse engineer it and, and get people to ask the question, can I watch your movie? That's one way, I guess, is how do I get people to say, can I see that please? Rather than me saying, please watch this. So the way that I do that, is, or you can do that any sort of number of ways, but, but I, that's kind of how I think about it is that I change my mindset from, I want people to watch my movie to how can I get people to want to watch my movie? Mm-hmm. It's almost like an art form in of itself but that's 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 sort of where where i'm at is in, in in my thinking that's great i i've never heard of that kind of switching your mindset to instead of like actively promote make it reverse engineer how do mm. people get onto your movie um are you posting on like facebook or instagram or twitter i mean what what where are you getting your audience from do you think I'm definitely getting it's it's funny because I've we we use um Twitter and Instagram um Discord like groups and communities mm-hmm. we have um obviously YouTube we've um delved a little bit into TikTok but I'm I don't understand TikTok it's, <laughs> it's I find TikTok so tricky but anyway uh, Reddit sometimes, um, and, and then uh, I've I've wanted for a long time to do. Um, so that's why Yakima is doomed was so. I showed everyone that I knew <laughs> Yakima is doomed. Oh, that right. was the coolest thing to me. But but that's the sort of thing that I've been wanting to look into a bit as well. It's like, hey, what would it look like if I put a QR code for the film and then put stickers all around town or. Um, mm-hmm. went to locations that the film was shot in and then get a still from that location and put a put a sticker up or a poster up with the QR code like hey I filmed the movie here you should watch it um, yeah but but that it's kind of yeah all those all those sort of spaces where I find the most success is probably Facebook to be honest mm-hmm. I don't find I get the most views from Facebook I get the most fans from a more intimate place like discord or twitter where you can it's a little bit more intimate i don't think anyone describes twitter as intimate but in this sort of film <laughs> space it's a bit like that yeah. yeah and then and then reddit i get big spikes of views but but i don't really have sustainable success there it's more if i can if i can frame it just right and people don't think i'm being selfish mm-hmm. i can i i get some success on reddit but yeah yeah. I'd say mainly mainly Facebook, but mm-hmm. I don't get any subscribers from Facebook. It's um, they're kind of two different, you know, people go yeah. there for different things. Exactly. Yeah. I found um like kind of like so I I found Facebook does really great for just view count. Like if you want views, Facebook is a good place. Just posting in film groups, casting hubs, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um but subscribers, you know, funny enough, I think the subscribe, the more subscribers we get, I think most of those come from YouTube itself. Because when you have a bunch of stuff like back catalog from, you know, a year ago or two years ago, 
um, there's people who will just stumble onto videos that you at the time maybe got like 30 views that day or that week or whatever. And then mm. they grew like e Ethan and I, we made a couple of videos on aspect ratio like two years ago. And mm. when they came out, we, we were looking at like 10 views, 15 views. And we were like, oh, that's disappointing. But you know, what? we love the video. It's something that we care about a lot. And, uh, and, you know, we're proud of it. And then flash forward to now, and I think one or two of those aspect ratio videos are like one of our most viewed videos on our channel. And you never know when someone will stumble upon like an old video of yours and go, oh, I love this. I'll, I'll check out their other stuff. So that's kind mm -hmm. of funny enough where we found a lot of where we get a lot of our subscribers from. Um, mm -hmm. and, and real quick before I forget, congrats on the aspect ratio switching on over the next horizon. As soon as I saw all that stuff happening, like uh, going in, uh, changing the frame size, I, that was anytime I see that in a movie, it, it's like, I always appreciate it. Um, I love that kind of stuff. What, what, where did that choice come from? Um, probably you guys to be quite honest. Like, <laughs> um, so, so I, I too, uh, I was probably one of those 30 to 50 people that enjoyed your aspect ratio video when it came out. And I actually made a movie from that. I went, oh, sweet. Like I should, I should make a movie in a, um, in a circle aspect ratio. That'd be really cool. Like, so I went and did that. And then, and then for over the next rise and I was like, oh, how do I, I think it was a conversation. I, I don't know if it was in a podcast or in a, in a specific video, but it was a conversation that you guys had around aspect ratio. And the conversation was um, that aspect ratio informs genre. So if you have like, um if it's like a vertical aspect ratio or if it's mm -hmm. a awesome just aspect ratio but it was what, what gear do you use as well so you, if you film it with an iphone it's like oh right now that translates to home video you know mm -hmm. oh, it's like a vlog or something um if you're filming with a you know old camera you're like oh archive footage um for me i was like oh what what would make someone feel like this these things have happened in the past what would make someone feel like this is old um and for me what that was uh what what would make people feel like it was old in my mind was oh a box because it's like instagram and memories and you know when you're scrolling through your old instagram photos everything's in a box so i was like in my mind at the time i was thinking it wasn't a very popular choice among my friends um <laughs> i don't think or my wife a lot of a lot of the different people that were um, creative influences for me in proximity to me were going, mm, don't do that. <laughs> for me, it felt like it's something important. And it was one of those things where I was like, no, overall, we're doing the box. Uh, we're doing four by three. It was totally effective, I think, because what's four by three, uh, I, we've said it before on our channel, but I think it translates really well to like close ups and it feels very mm -hmm. intimate and special. Um, as opposed to widescreen or even 16 by nine. So that that really, because it was in the flashbacks, these kind of warmer memories, um, I th mm -hmm. thought that was totally effective. And then also when you kind of get wider for the present day stuff, I mean, you guys have some gorgeous drone footage in there. You have gorgeous landscapes. So just having the present day be expansive and you get the sense of just this never ending isolated kind of just mm. loneliness that's stretching on for miles and the frame being huge. Mm. Um, I thought it was totally impactful because when you the frame is smaller, people take up more of the frame, depending on how you frame them. But in a close up, mm. let's say. Um, but if it if it's the frame is huge and bigger, there's a lot of extra space, you know, you can't get really tight and close to a person. They're kind of there's always a little bit extra space, you know, around them. Mm. So I loved how it was done in the in the movie um totally effective totally totally worked and of course you know there's some people out there who don't love aspect ratio changes we've encountered some of those but you know we can't please everybody no and it's um yeah but thank you i'm glad that was that was kind of the intention behind it was to make uh, when when the character was in the apocalypse it's like they're so small <laughs> right and alone and um, yeah, that's the idea. I want to talk about 2022, as I've 
said in the beginning, I really felt like it was your year in terms of all these different shorts you all were doing um, and your two features. For me, um, I think the first thing I saw from you all was probably Way of Death, but I might've seen some earlier stuff too. Um, so when I think of Late Night 99, the first thing that I think of is Way of Death, your, your Oscar uh, film. Mm. Uh, for you, when you think of this last year, what is there any particular project that you really think defines um, your, your kind of filmmaking career or your channel over the last year or so? Yeah, I'd say definitely, definitely over the next horizon for me is, mm -hmm. is the movie because that, that was the big project that was taking up so much of my time. Um, so for me, probably over the next horizon, if and the way of death as well is like mm. they they were both kind of really it was a really big deal for me at the time doing the way of death and that whole the whole oscars challenge with um that, that joel haver did that was that was super exciting for me and that was a big deal mm -hmm. uh, i'd say though probably over the next horizon was the the one for me the the, the one film that i think kind of defines 2022 for me but also as a turning point for the next year as well Mm -hmm. I, I kind of see Over the Next Horizon as when I released that for me and, and I, I was thinking, look, this is, things can't be the same after this. I made a feature <laughs> right. film, Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Can't be the same after this. Uh, uh, something, I have to do something different following this. I have to be, thing, things are getting real is, is how it felt. Mm -hmm. So for me, definitely Over the Next Horizon and the, the, uh, uh, I'd, I've never put, because I'm a very spontaneous, quick person. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm much more comfortable making quick short films and releasing them mm -hmm. than I am sitting down and planning out and making a bigger project. But the, the reward following that effort was so immense that, because we had a, we had a, a screening as well. We, we, we screened over the next horizon along with the way of death and some other films at a local theater. Mm -hmm. And 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 we we sold out the theater. It was it was all friends and family, of course, but it was super exciting to sit down and enjoy this movie with with an audience full of people. And and I just felt so proud and like I want to do this again and again and again. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. awesome. Um, and I I gotta say too, like um, the 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 your kind of I can't remember what you all labeled it as, but your your series of short horror films that you released in throughout October, um, I had such a blast watching all those back to back and back. I almost feel like, um, or I'm curious, would you ever like the idea of doing an anthology film where it's almost like a bunch of little short films pieced together? Um, is that something that interests you? in directing where it's kind of like taking these short films and putting them together as one thing or is it are you really looking at over the next horizon kind of as kind of a singular narrative in terms of what you're looking at doing in the future yeah it's funny funny you say that i uh am, am the the big project that's going to be happening next year <laughs> and we've got, yeah not announced it on on youtube or anything yet but on i've, I've kind of been rallying the troops so to speak Right. around a project we, we're with the working title of Marana mm -hmm. and the uh, idea behind this is that we'll it'll essentially be a big anthology film mm -hmm. um, but around it's still around the central narrative but um, just lots of different takes on it mm -hmm. so I definitely I definitely see anthology movies as, in our <laughs> film, but in terms of yeah it doesn't when I when I say that over the next, I want to do more things like over the next rise, and I do like I want to make more feature films just like that. Mm -hmm. um, and but I also want, I also see uh, we we tossed up the idea of doing a um, like a web series, mm -hmm. like an episodic, um, like maybe a limited series uh, on YouTube too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think instead, I kind of put a lot of our uh, thought a lot of our effort into doing a uh, uh doing the month of horror where we mm -hmm. released a bunch of those short films in one go that was right. kind of um the same same sort of energy mm -hmm. uh, and i think what i wanted to see was 
if I released a film, if I released a decent length, decent value film every week, for like four or five weeks straight, how would that help the channel? And it didn't. <laughs> oh no. But um, but it was lots and lots of fun. It was great, and and I'm 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 really happy with how they turned out. So some gr some great films. Um, I think um. The two that stand out to me in particular were um, the offering, the found footage one, the, yeah. the, the creature in that, or the, the kind of uh, being, entity in that one. I, I thought it was so creative and so awesome. And then Child in the Chapel, I, I really, really loved too. Um, and I understood, is that, was Child in the Chapel, was that one like improvised or was that shot on vacation, if I'm remembering correctly? Yeah, 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 that, that was shot entirely on vacation. So we, I say vacation. So, so, so Kristen, my wife, her, um, one of her grandparents actually died and we, we, we went to, um, to go to the funeral. We had to go and rent an Airbnb in, in sort of this, uh, in, in, in what we call the Lockyer Valley, which is this sort of like rural country area in, in Queensland. So we, the Airbnbs that we were looking at, um, one of them was this chapel, we went, oh, sweet, we should, should stay there. That'd be really cool. And it was a couple of days before that I said to her, um, hey, could, would it be okay if we, if we made a movie while we were on holiday? It would only be like an hour or two. It ended up being way more than an hour or two a day. I think it was, it ended up being a much, yeah, it ended up taking a lot more of the holiday than I think we would do next time. But it, um, we, uh, yeah, so it, it was very improvised. We, we had a rough idea. We kind of had a chat mm -hmm. about what we should do. We had a rough idea leading up to it, but the, um, the ending, the way that it ended was completely, we, we stayed up till like 1 a.m. the night before, just brainstorming together. What should we do? What should we do? We called my friend Joel and woke him up. I'm like, dude, what should we do? Like, how should we end this? And um, yeah, that's how we ended up there. But yeah, so yeah. long way about not really a vacation film. It was more of a funeral film. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, we, we decided to make a holiday of it and we did do some holidaying around that area. We stayed right. there for a few days, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so what, um, from all the projects you've done this year, like those, those October horror films and, and Over the Next Horizon in particular, what are a couple of lessons or one lesson? What's something that you've learned from doing those projects that you're going to take forward um, in whatever you do next? Um, I think for me, I've learned, I feel like I've learned a lot in each area of, of filmmaking. It's because I've, I've never been to film school, right? I've never, mm -hmm. um, I've never, properly formally studied film it's all sort of self-taught passion thing for me I did my high school had a film class that I a film subject that I did for two years um so I, I definitely can credit my 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 film and television teacher with a lot of um a lot of the uh, sort of theory knowledge mm -hmm. and then also practical knowledge of course how to um just basic filmmaking um or cinematography literacy and stuff but what I, I there's so much I've learned so I think <laughs> cinematography wise I've learned a lot about natural lighting mm -hmm. and how to how to step back and because I bought all these lights and I was like I need to I need to have lights to be a filmmaker so I bought a lot of lights and and then sort of overlit a lot of films that I was doing uh and and over complicated things and with The Way of Death and Over the Next Horizon and other films. More recently, I've just stepped back from the lighting. I just bring a tube light and chuck it in the corner. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, just as long as, it, as long as the subject's backlit, that's fine. Just set it up and go. Um, I've sort of felt a lot more confident in terms of setting up a, a visually pleasing image. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of editing, I think I've just gotten really fast, man. I just got really, really fast. Um, I don't think I've gotten any better at editing over time, but just faster. And that's <laughs> purely out of necessity. And I don't think I've become a better writer 
or story maker at all, but I've realized more and more how important having a good story is. So even though I'm not any better at writing stories, I understand now more than I did before how important it is to have a good story and have a story with themes and meaning and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So for I've, I've kind of been able to outsource that. And that's, again, a part of what the next year is going to look like too, is um, bringing in more filmmakers who can tell their stories and, and I'll help them tell their stories or, or produce their script rather than, um, you know, just doing everything on my own. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, so. It's great. Very random that answer to your question, <laughs> but. Yeah. No, it's great. And, and I think uh, too, um, in terms of the storytelling, um, I don't know what how much this means, but to you in particular. But I thought all of the the kind of visual story and aspect of of like over the next horizon, in particular, just you know, like you said, there's no dialogue in it. But the way you were able to convey all that entire story with no dialogue, I thought that mm. was a real strength to the movie. And I don't know what if you. I mean, you said that you didn't have a lot of dialogue because you weren't very confident as an actor or maybe as a writer, but I feel like um, that just made the visual so much stronger, not having any talking, not having any kind of, you know, exposition, so to speak. It's just, we're seeing it and you're telling the story just purely visually. Um, And I think that's an important skill in itself. Um, Mm. I think a lot of times when we talk about story, it, it involves, right the script right the the dialogue um sometimes character arcs but i think a lot of people think of you know dialogue or kind of what the characters are saying but i think visual storytelling um is just as important if not more important when it comes to moving i think you guys did uh you guys really knocked it out of the park with over the next horizon in particular um i mean all of them they're all great but uh, the, the, the fact that it relies there's hardly any dialogue in it or not very much is a strength mm. to the movie, I think, in my opinion. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that, but I, I think I'm I'm really I'm if I would remake the movie again, I would do it totally differently. But I'm so glad it's the way that it is. It really I think for me it really captures where I where I was this year as mm-hmm. a filmmaker. And um even though I would do it differently, you know, if I if I made if I remade over the next horizon every single year. Mm-hmm. That would be that's a really interesting idea. Like, <laughs> yeah, if you, every year you remade the same movie and saw how it was different each time. Mm-hmm. Um, but for for over the next horizon, for me, I'm I am really happy with it, and I am it's it's not perfect, but I uh, I think it's really cool, and and I, I I enjoyed I had a lot of fun playing in the cinematography space with it. That was that was kind of the aspect of it, the visual storytelling that I was the proudest of and that I had the mm-hmm. most fun of. I'm really glad you got to watch the movie, by the way. It's um, I'm glad to hear that you, you had a chance to watch it. That's really cool. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I felt bad because whenever we see new feature films pop up on YouTube, you know, I mean, we've said this before, but we're so bad at like watching those. So usually what happens is I'll block out a bunch of time to sit down and, and watch them all. And it was nice because since I knew we were meeting, it was kind of this like, okay, I can't, I can't talk to him without having seen the the one video from the channel that I haven't seen. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it was a nice excuse to do that. So I watched uh, Over the Next Horizon. What else did I watch? I watched some of Dan Lotz's movies. Mm. Um, there was one other one and I'm feeling really bad. I forgot what it was, but I, yeah, I, I watched a good handful of different, uh, youtube movies back to back um Mm. and over the next horizon yeah i was i was yeah very impressed i loved it a lot um i will say and so but this is just totally for like the here and now for like when we're recording this we're recording this on what's it the 22nd Mm. our our last video podcast of the year is coming out tomorrow the 23rd in mm. that podcast when we recorded, I had not seen Over the Next Horizon, so I did not shout out Over the Next Horizon. I said I d- hadn't seen it, but that was on my list. But in terms of like, because we were talking a little bit about the YouTube movies we've seen, so, mm. um, so 
okay if you see when you see that don't be offended don't be like wait he was lying to me no no because we recorded that like a week ago or so just so yeah. you know yeah no no don't, don't stress you guys have got a really <laughs> cool schedule going with your podcasts and the way that you've um how, how much do you do you guys so so do you film a podcast every single week Is that what you guys are doing at the moment uh yeah depend it depends it's been a little bit weird in the last weeks because it's been winter break for us so we've kind of taken some stuff off a little bit but pretty much um our normal schedule is usually we will meet on mondays just you know for production or for whatever and we'll record a podcast um for that week or the following week and it's really awesome when we get to have like block shooting or uh kind of recording so we have a bunch of them lined up for the month. So that's mm. that's kind of how we try to do it. It doesn't always happen, um, you know, because schedule stuff changes or things come up. But that's how we try to do it anyways, where it's kind of blocked out for the, the next month or so. Mm. But yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, um, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, I feel like it's the elephant in the room to an extent. Your your epic movie you're making with um, all these filmmakers from all over the world. You kind of touched on it a little bit. Talk talk a little bit about where did this idea come from, um, and what do you what's kind of your vision for the overall thing? Yeah, yeah. So the the idea came from uh, a, a concept I had some time ago, and I, I think I actually reached out to you guys to see if you'd be interested in. Um, another collaborative film mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that I was thinking about, and it was it was this film around. I might still do it, uh, but it was a film around a haunted, a haunted short film right. screen. That, that was That's right. Screened. That's right. Yeah, I remember. That's a great idea. Yeah. So the uh, my my and that that's kind of this idea, but a more curated version. Like, a, mm -hmm. oh, I'll ask the people I think are really great filmmakers, and I don't don't want people to feel, but the people that I feel like would be great filmmakers for that story. Mm -hmm reach out to a few people and I was like, oh, would you be in this? <laughs> and um, this is kind of the bigger version of that. So the, the where it came from was um, a bunch of places, like definitely the Joel, the Joel Haver Oscars thing. I was like, I was thinking, man, like imagine if all these were around a similar theme and then we can, we can watch it all um as as one because you can almost do that as you watch through. I know, I know Jenny watched through all the yeah, all I don't know. I don't know very many other people other than Joel himself who's possibly watched all. Of the movies. Yeah, I think but, Jennifer uh, might be the only one who's who's done it all. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she should make the video instead of Joel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she should. Yeah. But um, the for for me as well, where it's come from is it a lot of a lot of uh the the films that I've been really enjoying online. A, a, a part of me has has been thinking as i've been watching them if i could just edit this into a shorter tighter film it would be it would be different than what it is mm -hmm. but it would be super super engaging and and entertaining as a five minute film or a 10 minute short film um rather than a feature film because a lot of the a lot of the feature films that are out online um have, have these really have have these really strong emotional currents to them and they're they're kind of like these big flowing ebbing movies mm -hmm. uh and 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 they're they're great they are what they are but there would be something different if they were if they were different or if they're edited differently and i guess mm -hmm. that's the power of editing in film so a part of what i was thinking was hey it wouldn't be an incredible incredibly engaging stimulating experience to go and watch um all these filmmakers who um have such um great cinematography who tell such great stories and condense all those stories down and then experience like 50 of them all in one go mm -hmm. um and a part uh, so that that's i guess why, why i think it's a good idea is wow like all these <laughs> filmmakers are, are great storytellers and um, and and I think it, they would just really add. I watched um, what's it called? Contagion again recently as well. 
Yeah. And so, yeah. so that, that's a that's an anthology film. And um, so I was kind of thinking about thinking about that too. And then the the other reason is I'm due to me having to step back next year from the product from the film production side of things. Um, and just due to some things that are going on in my family and that kind of that kind of stuff, I'm going to be able to this is a project that I'm going to be able to really work on and, 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 and raise up to be a good child. And, and it, it's, it's, it's again, that resource for making it's like, okay, 2022 was the year where I had time. Time was my best friend. Uh, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't my wife or my family's best friend, but it's my best friend. <laughs> and, yeah. and very selfishly, I took a lot of time this year to go and make some really great, you know, uh, some really, great films so 2023 i'm being a bit more strategic about the future of late night 99 and 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 and, and as people do as families do and, and and at the end of the year you kind of um um take stock of everything that you have and go okay what does the next year look like what's what's going on and and for me i was think when when we took stock of everything going on and, and late night 99 is obviously a part of that okay so what's that look like next year and a whole bunch of things fell into place all together at the same time um with my filmmaking buddies and Anthony and anton coming in and being like hey we want to join we want to be a part of this we love what you're doing let's can we put our movies there too can we um because we because i help out on some of their films as well so it's kind of there's there's sort of like a wider filmmaking sphere in the local brisbane queensland australia filmmaking community there's sort of a wider sphere of filmmaking and some of those filmmakers are, are going to come and join this youtube sphere which is really cool uh kind of what you guys are doing with zach like and you know many hands make light work and and, mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing so that that sort of happened all at once and then i was thinking uh, and some other things have popped up and i've gone oh no i'm gonna be really time poor next year oh i'm not gonna be able to go on set um <laughs> so much but um but yeah so so being able to, to work on this project, sort of like remote, like remote work for filmmaking, I suppose. And I'll, I'll film my own segment for it too, but I think uh, it ended up, it's gonna be the perfect project for, for us for next year. And um, I think in 2023, we're gonna release more films than we released in 2022, if anything. That's great. Um, just less of them will be one man show films, or I don't think any of them will be. And it's gonna, it's gonna look more like um, this this community collaborative space and and that's more fun anyway. People don't tune in for the for the Alex or the Jordan show. People mm -hmm. um, people like to feel a part of something and 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 that's a lot more entertaining and enjoyable than um, you know from watching one person. I think right. anyway. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Um, and so, if anybody who hasn't heard, what is the premise of this um, giant? mega movie you're making so the premise of this giant mega movie is that a meteorite is hurling towards earth it's a story you've heard a thousand times before um and it's been kept a secret from the globe from the world and uh the the, the plot is that the, the news of this meteorite is leaked from some whistleblower um and 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 everyone hears everyone around the world hears the news that spreads like wildfire that world's ending in five days there is a meteorite heading towards Earth. We're all going to die, and it's happening. It's happening now. So, the the film is about a cast of characters who I haven't met yet. I don't know, <laughs> um, but this this cast of characters are going to experience the the stress and the trauma and the grief of um, of their own um, impending doom or their own impending death, and 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 how people respond to that. So the, the film's gonna, um, there, there, there's some awesome people that are, that are a part of it. It's, there's, there's too many to list, but the, uh, someone was saying in the discord, the trailer is gonna be super crazy. Cause it's gonna be from <laughs> the director of wildlife, um, chlorine, um, video carnage, the bell rings, you go through and there's just um, so many different films that are part of, uh, so many filmmakers that are part of this project it's um yeah it's going to be this beautiful chaotic mess i'm really yeah. excited 
Yeah, no, it's exciting. And so if someone wants to take part in this project, where, where should they message you on Twitter? Is there a place they can go? Yep, yep. We, we, have a, we have a Discord server that has all the information you need. There's some facts there, um, just in case you, um, you know, and if you need them to, um, to fill in your story at all, there's some guidelines, just very, very loose uh, guidelines. This is a big, um, this film for me is a big release of, so I can be a bit of a perfectionist and I can be a bit anal when it comes to everything has to be 4k everything has to be like like this mm -hmm. just not for the merit of that thing on its own but just so that it's the same as everything else but um this for me is a um a big release of that it's not curated at all if you want to be a part of it you can just be a part of it if you want to be in a feature film with me and jordan and or maybe the rc guys if you want to be in a feature film with dan lots and trent lasky if you want to be in a feature film with any of the filmmakers that you like online, you can just go and make something and um, and I'll make it in there. I'm determined to include every single thing that anyone sends in that they think um, that that's important to them, that they think would make a good story. Um, you can submit it in and, um, and be a part of the movie. That's great. That's awesome. I'm excited. I'll tell you, uh... I'll tell you our idea for ours after after we're done recording, but we we have ours ready, um, and just seeing in the Discord all the different ideas that people are doing is really um, it's helpful to help because you can kind of see who's covering what or what's going on. But it's also really inspiring because it gives you different ideas, new ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I think my favorite one. I'm a little bit biased, but the one that made me chuckle the most was the the RC boys, the Caleb and Nathan there um their two missionary idea uh, they cracked me up when they told me that in person <laughs> or i guess over video chat it was yeah it was fun yeah. uh yeah i'm i'm really looking forward to it and i and i'm praying and the best for your computer organizing all that footage and <laughs> I'm media, media to, management <laughs> all that stuff yeah i'm going to have to become a lot more organized cuz my my poor um um uh, my Poor brain is uh, has a tendency towards um, yeah being a bit attention deficit and being a little bit uh, hyperactive and disorganized. So I'm going to need to like one probably buy a brand new hard drive because I think kind of need at least four terabytes to hold everyone's all the footage. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, I'm going to have to be a lot more organized than I would normally be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. Um... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I that was honestly that was my first thought when I heard the project. I was like, "Oh, that's awesome!" Oh, damn, Alex's computer is kind of like I do not envy him from an editing standpoint because that seems just like a ton of ton of work. It's going to be like your Mount Everest of of uh, editing, but I'm sure I'm sure it's going to turn out great. I'm sure it's going to be awesome project. I'm just excited to see the end result. You know? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm excited to get it out as soon as possible. I'm, I'm the this is a curse of um, release dates. I'm I'm never announcing a release date ever again. I mm -hmm. over the next rise it was so stressful. Once I said 16th of July was what I said, and I it was right up until the last day. I was still making changes, still mm -hmm. still finalizing it, and and then trying to export it as well was a big challenge. Um, but yeah, so I'm definitely going to have to upgrade my computer before we do this yeah. one. But, and then for the month of horror, I set release dates for each of the four films. But um, don't scream that last one, just really the time just bled out on that one and it took way longer. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. never doing release dates again and, until it's like the week before. Like you guys have got yeah. it down to that. That's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't even we don't announce dates until the movie is ready to go on YouTube, like fully processed, fully rendered, all that kind of stuff until it's sitting on there. Cause we're just paranoid that, gee, what if something goes wrong? Um, no so. don't, don't change. Don't ever <laughs> change. It's, yeah. Uh, you'll regret it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, anyways, I would, I think, you know, given that we're recording this end of end of the year, I would really love to hear about, some of your favorite films that you've seen in the last uh, mm -hmm. year, 2022. Um, seeing as 
it's a time to reflect on you know the past year and all that um what are some movies that you 2022 releases that you saw this year that you really spoke to or connected or you connected with a whole bunch? Mm. Wow. There, seriously, there, there has been so many films that have been released. It's, I'm going to forget. The moment that you ask something like this and <laughs> you immediately, every single film that you watch just goes, Bleh, just yeah. Comes out of your ears. I, um, let me have a think. I think the 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 Oscars, the the Oscars project was that was the single most exciting week, mm -hmm. nearly of my whole year. Um, <laughs> was was that week watching all the films released, and I just remember the feeling when I checked out that when I looked at the playlist, I'm like, oh, which how many have been released? And I saw one called One Square Foot of My Yard. <laughs> yeah and it was it, it was released like instantly and it's got i think it's got like twenty thousand views like it's it's done really well but um i remember seeing that and going no way someone made a short film about ants that's insane <laughs> um or a feature film about ants so uh i think the, the the oscars time was really exciting and i enjoyed watching um crescendo i enjoyed watching one shot I enjoyed watching um, Sulit, was really great. That was Jenny's mm -hmm. film. Uh, there was uh, what else? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up my pull a litter box. Yeah, I'm gonna pull up my litter box to get help. Uh, every, because... every time that someone asks me, it's the same question, um, or it's the same thing. I need always need to check litter box because apparently I can't remember anything. Um, I, I know for me, I think. I mean, because we'll talk about it in our episode tomorrow or whatever, but we, I think, because we gave our top three movies of the of the year or something like that. And I think for me, it was uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once was one that Ethan mm -hmm. and I loved. Um, I think Pearl was another one that I really loved and um, Avatar mm -hmm. 3. I was a big fan of, or not Avatar 3, Avatar 2, the new Avatar. Yeah. Sorry, time traveling there for a sec. Yeah. Yeah, the um those those were those were all great movies. I've not seen I've not I've not seen Pearl or Avatar two. I'm I'm really really pumped to. So I saw X and I thought mm -hmm. that was so so fantastic and and because I knew that Pearl existed before X, mm -hmm. I the plot twist for X still worked for me because I just thought Mia Goth's character had a wife <laughs> before yeah uh, stardom or um so it was really like the the twist for x still worked for me i was like what no way and then I, <laughs> I realized just at, in some of the final scenes i realized what they were doing with prosthetics and mm -hmm. makeup so okay so 2022 releases uh just going through hell is a timeshare in florida was yeah I, I really enjoyed that i enjoyed that from a cinematography perspective i think um the i yeah it's just um it's just Joel going nuts, which was super cool. Mm -hmm. um, I liked Singularity. I thought Singularity yeah. was really cool in, the, in terms of the Oscars. Um, that was great. Uh, like Yesterday. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. That was really cool. Um, I think FSD Productions, I think they call themselves. I don't want to get that wrong, but um, um, yeah, that, that film was really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, Andy D'Angelo um, directed that one. It was sort of a... Um, Sort of like a romantic stoner comedy, but I've not seen that. Um, not seen that from the YouTube space yet. Mm -hmm. not, you, can, you see a lot of films, but but not like that. So that was really really exciting. Uh, what else came out? Wildlife came out. Um, Calvin Zimmerman made that. So that that was a really they made an amazing film there, and just to hear the story about how that came to be was really awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and else has come out hotel i remember i've watched oh, hotel yeah? like three times i watched <laughs> hotel as sitting down watching on my phone no i listened to hotel as an audio book while i was driving mm -hmm. uh just because it's such a dialogue heavy film and um and you, you can experience it like that as well the cinematography is sort of the the frame to the film's picture if that makes sense and the right. um so I didn't, I felt like the experience was almost different. I could focus on different parts, just listening to it. 
and then and then I watched it again when I sat my wife down and showed her. And I, um, so, so yeah, I really I really enjoyed Hotel. That was a really good time. Uh, what else was there? Um, I mean, there was it was. I mean, what I love about the YouTube space sorry. now is there's so many. You you mm. can't. You, it's impossible to watch them all. You can't keep track of them all. You're obviously the bell rings and two little ghosts were amazing as well. Um, they they that was really really cool. I I so the bell rings just blew me away. I watched the bell rings twice. <laughs> I haven't yeah. seen it three times, but um, I'll get there. I will eventually. So, um, I, I the only reason I've not watched it three times is I can't listen to it in the car. There's not enough. Um, doesn't make a good audio book. No, no, not, <laughs> not really. But I, I remember when I watched the bell rings that the opening scene with the bells in the tree, mm -hmm. it took me a second to realize what that was. And that was the perf the, that opening shot was the perfect length because it was just enough time for me to process, hold on, is that a bell on that tree? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course your, your film Two Little Ghosts. And um, I think even more than what, enjoying that film, I've, I enjoyed hearing the story behind it and how it, how it came to be is almost more entertaining or just as entertaining as the as the um as the film itself i i agree i think the making of that movie is more interesting than the movie itself <laughs> in a weird yeah. way yeah uh and yeah you'd be obviously i feel like I feel bad just naming the the big guys because of course Joel Haver and, and Dan and, and mm -hmm. others have made some really great movies and of course Hollywood's pumping out movies that are that are cool and good. Uh there's there's a really actually hold on, there's a movie I've watched. It's not super popular, um, or it's not super well known. It's called The Nightingale. It yeah. didn't come in twenty twenty it didn't come out in twenty twenty two. Um, that was um what's her face who did um jennifer kent jennifer kent yeah yeah she did the babadook before nightingale mm. i started to watch nightingale i really liked it but then i realized oh boy this is going to be very emotionally intense and then i stopped it because i was like i need to be in a better headspace to take yeah. in this movie so i haven't finished it but i started it and i really really liked it yeah the, the nightingale was like blew me away like it was really 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 amazing and it was a good uh it was a good film for because it's obviously it's set in australia uh, mm -hmm. and it's a good film for to kind of reflect on uh our history and our uh and our um our past and it's it's good because there's there's not it can never be too much of that you know and um, right. it makes you think all right so i have to quickly i'd be amiss not to mention um does this taste like Dick Reeser to you? So it's fellow Australian filmmakers Woodstock Roadshow mm -hmm. released their feature film um, for free on YouTube. And it goes for an hour and 25 minutes. It's called Does This Taste Like Dick Reeser to You? Yeah. So it's about some um, like bogan redneck Australians um, who go, um, it's like a road trip movie essentially, but Mm -hmm. it's really great it's really zany uh it reminded me of um from my memory was it almost like a guy Ritchie tarantino kind of thing a little bit i mean it's, yeah. it's i think it's it's more of a comedy but it's kind of like that crime comedy kind of blend to an extent i think yeah it was a fun yeah. one yeah that was a good one um and and also um so um it I first got to know Reese um, or Dashing Agent, as he's known on, um, as his channel is called, uh, through the Oscars challenge. Mm -hmm. um, when I saw his movie Pillow, which was fantastic. If you've not watched it yet, you have to watch Pillow. It's so good. And um, it has such a good uh, twist, but I don't want to say any more. Uh, so Pillow was awesome. And he's ju actually just re recently released um, Cobblestoned. Which is his, uh, which is a like a it's a, again like it's a two and a half hour feature film, mm -hmm. but it's he's made it over the last five years. So this has been his one project over the last five years has been cobblestone, mm -hmm. and uh, and I've I've not finished it yet. I've watched like the first maybe hour, but it's it's really funny. 
It's just yeah. the humor in it is just so, it just nearly every single joke lands. It's a very, very entertaining movie. I haven't seen Pillow, but I've seen Cobblestone. That one was like, I, I mean, I think that's one of the benefits of uh, uh, YouTube filmmaking to extend is the filmmakers, they can have it as long or as short as they want. And it's a, uh, it, the runtime is, might be intimidating for some folks to like immediately click on it, but it's, it's a good watch. It's like, it's a great film. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what, are there any other films on your, on your list for 2022? There, there would be, but I think, I think I've expired my my brain for for thinking about it. I there, there of course there is. There's so like just I would I'd just say go if you want to watch a movie, go and have a look on YouTube and see what's there first because mm -hmm. you you never know what you're gonna find. You're not gonna find the most polished films, but um, boy, they're entertaining. You know. Yeah, yeah, good sentiment. Um, and I and I gotta ask you quick too before you know this is over um there's a ton of great australian filmmakers in the youtube mm. filmmaking sphere there's mm. a, a road show or i can't remember the the does this taste like degreaser guys yep. there's mohat there's Radul, there's holly hargraves mm. um there's a ton of really talented australian filmmakers and i mean <laughs> I, that's more of a statement than a question, but, uh, you know, what, I mean, is there anything in particular about Australia that you think breeds just such great filmmakers or is there any like in shared influence that you all have? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on Australian film and maybe YouTube and all that? I don't know. I think maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's that, um, because the Australian film industry for independent filmmakers is pretty tough. Like there's not, it's tough everywhere for everyone, right? Right. But I feel like it's pretty tough. There's not a lot of opportunity for for really grassroots independent film. Uh, there's there's some great government incentives that have kind of been set up. So there's uh, like Screen Queensland is one. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the government has some arts incentives and some arts um like grants and stuff so i in the future i'll definitely see the possibility of myself applying for some of those grants mm -hmm. and to receive funding i think that's po possible that's a lot more likely than me the likelihood of me receiving a grant from the government is much more likely than me uh receiving funding from a studio if that makes mm -hmm. sense right so um, so that's pretty cool, but, but aside from that, it's, it's, I feel like it's quite hard to, to make it or to, to have put your films out there as an Australian filmmaker. So maybe, maybe that's the reason that a lot of us go to YouTube mm -hmm. as well is, um, for lack of other options, mm -hmm. uh, festivals are harder in Australia as well, I suppose, because you've got, you've got a couple of scammy ones that are, that have been, that are Australian, but are, are kind of scammy. Mm -hmm. that you have that with all festivals and then you have some more legitimate ones but uh it just it can feel like and it's a benefit as well as a limitation but it can feel like the the filmmaking community is really small and it's kind of hard to to burst out of that bubble into the next layer of or the next um the next circle of filmmaking mm -hmm. in terms of experience and um and influence and that kind of thing so for, for me, for us, I kind of see it as ejecting from that whole system of um, you have to, because I've been on heaps of film sets, I've gone and helped out on, on loads of local productions and, and met some really great cinematographers and directors and, and, uh, and, and, and I wouldn't, um, yeah, I wouldn't miss those opportunities for anything, but mm -hmm. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's really freeing to just eject from that and just go, no, nah, yeah. I'm going to go <laughs> and just release my films on Mars, like, and, uh, rather than deal with the, um, yeah, deal with the, the networking and, 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 and becoming important in your own little bubble. Mm -hmm. You can be, um, yeah, you just join another bubble or make another circle, you know? Right.
Right. But, so maybe that's it. I don't know. I don't. I, <laughs> my. Uh, I think there's great filmmakers everywhere. Um, there's just less Australians. So. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's it. Then. Are there any uh, Australian filmmakers or films in particular, um, YouTube or otherwise, that are kind of maybe quintessential Australian or maybe influenced you in particular in some way? Uh, there's, there's some really great, so in terms of Australian filmmakers, um, there's, there's some really cool people um, who are, who are maybe filmmakers or actors in the, in that are Australian that really, I feel like represent or, um, or, or build up Australian film in a really cool way. Mm -hmm. So a few of those are, um, so John Jarrett, Mm -hmm. is um is an australian actor um but he it's it's i follow him on social media and it's really cool the amount of independent and and low budget films that he actually participates in and acts in he was the guy he's the guy from wolf creek oh okay um he's the, the killer from wolf creek he's also uh in um django unchained you know quentin tarantino's cameo yeah so yeah. he's the other Australian guy that <laughs> was acting alongside Quentin Tarantino and they got blown up by dynamite. Nice, nice. So John Jarrett, um, actually, uh, my, my parents grew up watching him on a, on a show called Play School, which is like mm -hmm. a kid's TV show. He's a mm -hmm. Play School presenter. Um, and, and, and then he's kind of developed his career from there, obviously. So I, I think... It's not really answering your question, but John Jarrett is is a great example of someone who who supports independent film. Mm -hmm. uh, another one's quite possibly Eric Banner. Um, okay, yeah. Eric Banner is really cool. He's Australian. He recently did uh, a film called The Try, which mm -hmm. was produced in Queensland um, through Screen, Screen Queensland. Mm -hmm. Not sure how well it did, but it was a really great movie. Um, really felt very Australian. Um, Jennifer Kent's another one. She, right. um, uh, I really, I really enjoy watching movies, and it makes me feel really happy to watch movies when they're set in Australia. Mm -hmm. They, uh, the actors are using Australian accents. You're seeing um, Australian landscapes, mm -hmm. um, and I say Australian landscapes, but it looks like if you're in some areas of Australia, it snows. You know, in some yeah. areas, it's blistering hot. Like, and the architecture is different everywhere you go, but. Um, it's there's this big fad or maybe not a fad and i'm not the authority to speak on this either so i'm just talking out of my ass yeah. but <laughs> there's a i see a lot of australian actors or local actors putting on american accents or <laughs> pretending like they're american so that they um so that they're more horrible or that they're more desirable as actors mm -hmm. and and that makes me feel a little bit sad I think, oh man, you know, just just speak in your normal like, like accent. Like it's great to be able to do accents. Maybe this is just me being jealous that I can't do an accent, but <laughs> I also feel like a lot of the accents aren't very good. And it's um, I'm I'm currently working on a film. It's may not even come out next year, but it's about um, it's about sort of um, the it, it, like it's it's a very urban crime um thriller because that sort of a long story but I work in child protection so I work with a lot of kids who are in uh, the child protection system or who are really vulnerable and like street kids and that sort of thing mm -hmm. so uh there's there's a lot of things that are really quintessentially Australian that aren't depicted in film because we try so hard to be like America or to be right. like Hollywood that we kind of miss a lot of those things that are really Australian Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's interesting um and it's it's funny that actors do that because coming at it from an american perspective i know that we think of ourselves as like having no accent right but everybody has an accent but we mm -hmm. love it's just uh, people in general love accents whether it be australian british german mm -hmm. you know whatever accent people in america really love hearing different accents so it is a shame when people feel like they need to hide out their natural um the way they mm. naturally speak have mm. you have you seen animal kingdom no i've not that Cause, is because that's a it's not quite you know 
I'm sure it's not super similar to the film you're working on, but it's a crime film, you know, set in Australia. And that's just something that I, I'd never seen before. Like, oh, it's kind of like The Godfather to an extent, but it's in Australia and it's, it's, a, it's a good one. I think, um, oh, I can't remember. Is it Jackie Weaver? She's an older woman, older actress. There, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a couple of uh, bigger actors, and I'm not sure if Joel Egerton's in it or not. He might. Oh, be. That's, that's another one. Joel, Joel Egerton. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Animal Kingdom. Who's in it? Is it? I'm pretty sure that guy. It's this. I think it's the director who did the Rover, um, with uh, yes. yeah, that that guy. Both both of those films I love. Mm. yeah yeah no it is yeah nick nick copas i think or mm -hmm. um anyway yeah no yeah. I, I i definitely still need to watch animal kingdom but that on my yeah. list is yeah if you're looking for something that's like i don't know maybe not like australia i mean i'm 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 a dumb american i don't know what i'm talking about but like i could see like wanting more genre films coming out of Australia, it seems like it'd be a good one to watch because it is, you know, it's a crime family drama, kind of like The Sopranos or Godfather or something like that. So it's a good one mm. to check out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I could keep going for on and on and on, but I think we got to call it here. Um, you got a family. <laughs> I, got, I got other work I got to get back to. But it has been so nice getting to talk with you and having you on the show and just, you know, finally putting up, you know, speaking, I say face to face, but it's really over a video call. But, you know, online, it's so, you know, it's always text messages. It's kind of faceless. Yeah, it's, um, as, it's as close as we're going to get to face to face. Hey? Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any, is there any last little thing you want to share with the people listening or watching? Or is there any, like, plug, something you want to plug um, at all? Yeah, look, we um we're we're actually releasing a movie on on Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. uh, which will be exciting. It's called Heist of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's a um it's just a it's a straight comedy. Mm -hmm. We haven't done too many of those. I um I didn't direct this one. I wasn't super involved in this production. This is one by Anton, um who uh, but there there will be some familiar faces there uh, from other films as well, just due to our circle being so small and and us all helping each other out so that it'll be released prior to this podcast being released but go back and watch it if the mm -hmm. uh, if your christmas tree's still up take that as a sign to go and watch high school christ <laughs> yeah. um we and and yeah just i guess if you're if you're still here watching at the end you're probably uh, a filmmaker too uh so go and go and message me or um find the link to the discord maybe you can share the link in the in the podcast description or something but go and yep. watch that because oh, go, go and be a part of that go and make a movie um it's the the buy-in is really it's a really small buy-in because you you don't have to have the burden of editing or distributing the thing you just have to shoot the footage and, and palm it off you can um yeah, it's not it's not something you have to um uh, you have to journey with for for a really really long time but mm -hmm. it's it's something you can you can be a part of quickly and yeah <laughs> zombies at the door uh -oh. getting, um, getting getting yeah <laughs> the shining over there yeah um well awesome yeah it was it was awesome getting to talk to you we'll share all that information in the description um <laughs> but yeah this is this has been great so go check out late night 99 all their films um go join their their uh community movie um you know check them out on twitter all that stuff you know they're great voice and filmmaking talent on youtube and uh can't wait to see what they do next thanks jordan we'll have to do it again yeah for sure <laughs>